Good morning and welcome to Shattering Myths, the program devoted to the fastest growing segment of the world society. To those of you who have come to realize that all religious, political, economic, and military institutions are corrupt, that they are counterproductive and rotten to the core, I am Yada. Our number, if you'd like to join us over the next two hours, toll free 877-300-7645. The Los Angeles Times, in a bleed heart, liberal, agenda driven, politically correct, environmentalist piece of rubbish, decided to write the final following article on the California drought and the consequences of it. They weren't savvy enough, rational enough, well enough informed to look at the cause of it. Because all they would say is that, well, water is a precious resource and, and we have to conserve it. Rather than recognizing that 6,000 years ago, man figured out how to do what we are no longer capable of doing. You see, it has been the long history of civilization that people want to live where the weather is good. People don't like to live in swamps. People don't like to be infected with the diseases that are born out of swamps. People like to see the sun. And so, what the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Sumerians, the Egyptians, the Greeks and the Romans, the Carthaginians, all figured out how to do was to take the water where it was plentiful and take it to where the people wanted to live. It became the most important aspect of government. In Egypt, you take Egypt, for example, the canals off of the Nile to provide both transportation, irrigation, and water for people to, uh, to drink and to bathe, to irrigate, was the, the, literally the foundation of that society. Babylon became Babylon because of its ability to channel water. The greatest achievements of Rome, the only one that that are actually positive were their aqueducts. And yet now, thousands of years later, we are not only incapable of building such things, or rec even recognizing the need for such things, we have college idiot educated idiots writing articles that don't understand that that's the problem. There's exactly as much water on this planet today as there was a million years ago before humankind existed. It's simply a matter of allocation, of taking it from where it is plentiful to where it is needed. And you know, this, this is a remarkable cycle of the earth, whether it be through drainage into the earth and then into water conduits and reserves within the, the soil, or it, as we have seen for millions of years, that all rubber rivers run to the sea. And yet the sea is not overfilled and the rivers continue to run because of this marvelous engine that is a result of our sun. Evaporating the water in the oceans, lifting it up into the clouds, and dropping that water on the land. But it's way beyond the politically correct environmentalist, um, climate change, global warming, advocating journalists to see it that way. No, everything for them is as climate change really is. 
It's an economic issue. It's about those rich people that are just, they're just guzzlers. And the poor people who are suffering because the rich are taking from them. Class warfare. It's the very thing that ignited the revolution in China that led to the death of 40 million people. Very essence of the attitude in Russia that led to the deaths and imprisonment of 40 million more in just in the last hundred years. But the Abominator, he is spectacular at class warfare. And so this isn't a matter of water distribution. No, according to the politically correct environmental wacko journalists, I use that term loosely and in air quotes, of the Los Angeles Times, no, it is strictly a matter of class warfare. You see, they were in Compton, California. Alicia Thomas, a stay-at-home mother in this working-class city. In other words, she doesn't work, except when I have no problem raising her children. But is she staying at home because she's has the government paying for her to do so? What do you think the chances are that she's among the one in four Americans receiving food stamps? And in California, she can stay at home, eat bonbons all day on the government, while she receives the equivalent of $20 an hour, as if she were actually working, but doesn't want to do that. Oh, yeah, she's a stay-at-home mother in this working-class city. Compton is not a working-class city. Tells her children to skip a bath on days when they do not play outside. Well, that's good mothering, isn't it? And holds down, and that holds down the water bill. <laughs> yeah. Telling your children not to bathe. That's good parenting, all right? That holds down the water bill. Lillian Barrera, a housekeeper who travels 25 miles to clean homes in Beverly Hills, serves dinner to her family on paper plates well, for much the same reason. In the fourth year of the severe drought, conservation is a fine thing. I want to tell you, paper plates is not a way to conserve water. It's a way to avoid having to do the dishes and throw them away. That's not conservation when you use paper or plastic dishes. Idiot writing this article. It's not a fine thing. It's a lazy thing. But in this Southern California community, water saving means saving money. Well, it, it, very few communities have raised the basic rate of water to those who use the least amount of it. What they've done is penalize those who use the most of it. It's uh, the opposite of business economics because it's driven by government. In business, the more you use, the more favored rates you get. It's a natural thing. You reward your largest customers. If you don't reward your largest customers, you're going to be out of business. But, you see, the business of government has never been business. It's about redistributing wealth. Because that's how politicians get elected. So their water bill is no different than it previously was, nor are there any restrictions on their use of water. It's the people with yards who think it's environmentally beneficial to keep the plants alive as opposed to watch them die. That are the ones that are being penalized here. The fierce drought that is gripping the West and the imminent prospect of rationing and steep water price increases in California, as opposed to the natural fix, which is aqueducts. But no, nope, no, nope, we want we want to ration water because it puts the government in control. But by the way, water won't be the only thing that's rationed. Electricity will be rationed. Gasoline will be rationed. Everything that you need to live 
is going to be controlled and rationed by government. About a month from now, we will do a program. Roy, who listens to this program, who was a major contributor to the program on his discussions on dimensions and uh, of the timing of the creation account, uh, sent me an email the other day of all of the ways economically our lives are being set up for total control. The digital nature of everything that we own and the digital nature of all of the services, particularly water, electricity, gasoline, and the interconnection between those digital files and our savings accounts and our home ownership and our credit cards. How we have set ourselves up for absolute and total manipulation and control. We'll do that as soon as I get settled after the, uh, the move. They say that the steep price increases in California is sharpening and sharpening the deep economic divide in this state. The deep economic divide in California. Gee, California is so horrible that about a quarter of its population came here illegally just to endure the horror of it all. Steep. Sharpening. Economic divide. Oh, my God. And it's so steep that California pays its welfare recipients the equivalent of $21 an hour for not working. And California has the highest state income taxes. You know, if, if the highest state income taxes to redistribute wealth ain't enough to fix the great and, and deep economic divide, what is? Or does disproportional, what they call progressive tax, simply exacerbate the problem? It simply causes those who are productive to be less productive, which gives less opportunity to others, which causes them to be dependent. So the great progressive tax experiment in California has obviously failed based upon the deep economic divide in this state. And it's illustrating parallel worlds in which wealthy communities come the water as the poor communities conserved by necessity. We'll be back as soon as I finish crying. Just a pejorative. The wealthy. Oh, they're just guzzling water. Guzzling it. And the poor little communities, uh, they're, they're being forced to let their children die of thirst. Come on, folks. There's no shortage of water to take baths and to drink. I mean, this is just so ridiculous, absurd. There's a reason that in Compton, they don't use as much water as they use, for example, in Beverly Hills. Guess what they don't have in Compton? Large piece of the property. Yards. Most of the homes in Compton don't have lawns and gardens. And those that do, their lawn and garden are very small. In Beverly Hills, the, the homes are set back at least 50 feet from the street. The lots average an acre. They're planted. And you know, last time I checked, if you want to keep a plant alive, it's water. Water is essential to life, which is why civilizations vastly more rational, vastly more effective, vastly more moral than ours today, took the responsibility of distributing water from where it was plentiful to where it was needed. All of this is a direct result of stupidity on behalf of the U.S. government and on behalf of the state of California. Yes, there was a period of time where they decided that California, which is the breadbasket of America, uh, would have to forego water for the agricultural zones uh, throughout the Central Valley because there was a, a fish 
in the San Francisco Bay that liked brackish water, but there was a concern that if more of the water was diverted from the Sierras and the snowfall in the Sierras to Southern California, that these little fishies, which by the way aren't, aren't commercially harvested, they're not caught, they're not eaten, these little fishies would uh, cease to thrive in the brackish water because the water would become too brackish. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen the San Francisco Bay as it, uh, particularly in the, uh, the areas that are, that are shallow, but it's kind of like the Dead Sea. Darn near nothing grows there. And so to make a decision on behalf of the health of these fish, which would just simply have to move a little further out to sea, was that you know, the rest of the, uh, the community would have to go parched because we were just going to dump the water into the sea. But that is the decision, and nonetheless, that has been uh, been made. So now we have this um, this issue, which is the wealthy community's cozy water is poor neighbors conserved by necessity. They don't conserve by necessity. No, there. You know, we have now half of America that's a net beneficiary of government indulgences handouts. And Compton happens to be a community where not everyone, there's a lot of people in Compton that are good people, that work for a living, that pay their bills, that aren't crying over uh, whether or not their children can take a bath. So I don't want to brush Compton with one paintbrush, but there's a high percentage of Compton, probably well over 50%, that is the recipient of government handouts. I mean, when you go through that supermarket line, if you're personally responsible, you ought to know that of the other three people that may be in line with you, on average, one of them is going to pay for their groceries, not with their money, but with your money. And a very similar number of people are receiving government handouts for a number of other reasons as well. So now, where wealth redistribution has uh, failed to achieve the, the total deprivation of the wealthy, now the mantra will be to use climate change as a reason to deprive them. That, no, we're not just going to penalize them monetarily. Now what we want to do is we want to restrict them. We're not going to give them the water. Let their yards die. If taking their money was insufficient, if giving their money to people who were not productive was ineffective, we're simply going to preclude them having access to water. Uh, and next it'll be gasoline, then electricity. The daily water consumption rate was 572 gallons per person in Cowan Heights. That's a, a uh, community that uh, um, has uh, average parcels of an acre, so they have landscape. And this consumption per person is absolutely irrelevant. Uh, having been a victim of, um, of poor water management, um, I've come to realize uh, exactly what it takes in terms of gallons over an acre of uh, of landscape, and that that the allocation that is uh, given, for example, to the community that I'm in, where the average parcel is one acre, there men, I think that's actually the smallest parcel is one acre, probably the same in Cowan Heights. That to put a uh, a half an inch of water. Uh, on uh, your irrigation once a week, which is about half of what you need in the summer. So that's, that's just bottom line if it's going to survive. That's you doing everything you possibly can to distribute that water through drip systems, through taking the lawn areas that you have and cutting them only 
oh, twice a month, uh, mowing them high and replacing your plants with drought-tolerant plants as bringing in as much mulch as you possibly can. That's being as judicious as you can possibly be and only irrigating after uh, long, hot, dry, uh, or windy periods and prolonging it uh, otherwise. That at a, a half an inch a, uh, a month, then on, a, uh, 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 on an acre of, uh, of landscape, your minimum use is about 10,000 gallons uh, each week just for the irrigation. That's the math. It's about 10,000 gallons a week for uh, to just if you're extraordinarily uh, diligent about using the minimal amount of water. And so it, and if you were to take much shorter showers, fill buckets that can be irrig to irrigate plants uh, while the water is warming up, take out your old gas water heaters and replace them by uh, on-demand water heaters, uh, and if you were to run only laundry once a week, dishwashers maybe twice a week, if you're just as diligent as you could possibly be, what you do inside is so negligible as to be almost meaningless. It's a, it's a hiccup. You know, even the old adage, if it's brown, flush it down, if it's yellow, mellow. Yeah, has, has so little influence on your water consumption by comparison to what it takes to just keep landscape alive is, uh, is the reason that there is a disparity here between what is used in Compton and what is used in a community of landscaped uh, homes. So it's 572 gallons per person in uh, Cowan Heights. Uh, the hot, dry months uh, during uh, July and September, of course, they took the, uh, the period where you actually have to water your irrigation the most. Uh, I, then by comparison, uh, it is uh, 16.3 gallons per person in Compton during that same period. So, you know, one-eighth eight times, and that's simply the math of, of landscape. The difference in the size of the parcel and the amount of landscape and the quality of the landscape in one place versus another. And so it has nothing to do with the per person. Using it as a per person measure, where Compton would be heavily Hispanic, heavily Catholic, lots more people per home. I mean, they'll still have two and three families in a home in Compton, where typically you have a small family in the homes in, uh, in a place like Cowan Heights. And they've decided to use it as a per capita number when it has nothing to do with per capita. It has all to do with parcel size and whether or not parcels are landscaped or not. But there is their comparison for the purpose of trying to create this. The rich are guzzlers. They need to be stopped. Government needs to come in and take their water and give it to those poor thirsty people Compton, before they die of thirst. Now, California is trying to turn that dynamic on its head. Now, of course, California is one of the most liberal places on earth. It's trying to turn that dynamic on its head, forcing the biggest... Water users, which include some of the wealthiest communities, to bear the brunt of the statewide 25% in water consumption, ordered by Governor Moonbeam, Jerry Brown. Cowan Heights is facing a 36% cut in its water use compared with 8% for Compton. Do you know? Do you have any idea? Over the last year, what, uh, what our rationed allotment was, I had to cut water by 75%, one year to the next. 
I had to reduce our water consumption by 75%. We're not talking about 36%. We're talking about 75%. And here they're whining. Over 8% cut for Compton, 36% for Cohen Heights, 8% for Compton. You see, they're not about to simply do this with economics. No, this is not going to simply be wealth redistribution because wealth redistribution doesn't work. It makes everybody poor, makes the government more powerful. That's all it does. Makes people dependent upon government, makes the government more powerful, and bankrupts everyone in the process. It, it destroys the economy. It hasn't worked anywhere, and it only makes a situation worse. So this time, no, they're actually going to take, just as they restricted our use of water, said you can only have 25% of the water you use last year. And these areas, they're going to restrict your water. You, you have to use 36% left. But the folks in Compton, you know, they don't need to forego the baths for their kids. They're only having their water use cut by 8%. Other wealthy communities must cut 30%, 36% include Beverly Hills and Hillsboro, a luxury town in Silicon Valley. Along with Compton, other less wealthy communities are facing more modest cuts, including Inglewood, which has been told to reduce its water consumption by 12%. You see, there is a standard in America that has been established where rather than taxing everyone and have everyone paying their fair share, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to control everything from your assets to your income, to your use of commodities. And we're going to control you in that way. We're going to tell you whether or not your plants can live or die. We're going to dictate that to you. We'll soon dictate whether or not you can drive your car. We'll dictate what kind of car you can have. We'll dictate whether or not you can turn on your air conditioning. My friend Kirk lives in, uh, I believe, in Northern California. Mm -hmm. But but I came from, I came, I lived and had a house in uh, Cowan Heights. And, uh, oh, okay. So you know that so, community. Yeah, it, and and the lots are part of an acre to to an acre, a lot of half an acre stuff, and it's uh, okay. it's very it's very hilly. It's the uh, northern hills of Santa Ana. Okay. It's an unincorporated area, and you, uh, it when I left, most of my students came from there. And, okay. Uh, so, uh, but I, I lived there. I took out the grass only because I wanted a, a, I wanted a putting green. But, uh, <laughs> to put in the artificial thing. Oh, yeah. Great, great, great little putting green, too. Oh, yeah. But yeah, uh, everything is full of trees. I would ask you a question. Yeah, you were on a, you were, you'd you have a, a hillside lot? Oh, yeah. That's Cowan Heights. You, yeah. There's no flat part up there. It's all on the hill. Okay. Um, are you likely to use more water or less water? on a uh, hillside than you are on a flat parcel. I'm just seeing how gravity has an effect on it. It does kind of drain down. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you more likely or less likely to have runoff on a uh, hillside parcel than a flat parcel? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not going to stay. Uh, in California, if you have a south-facing uh, parcel, are you likely to need more water than you would if your hillside was facing the north? Uh, I would think you'd probably get, uh, well, I'm not. Let's see. Yeah, you're going to use a lot more water yeah. uh, if, you're, uh, if your parcel, if the hillside that your parcel is on faces south versus uh, a flat parcel or a parcel on the north side of a hill. Oh, okay. That's because uh, of, the, uh, of the orbit of the, uh, the, uh, mm -hmm. of the earth yeah. around the, uh, the sun in the wintertime and the, and the tilt uh, uh, on our axis in the northern hemisphere. Uh, south is when you're going to be exposed to the, uh, the sun for the longest period of time, and the sun is, has a drying effect. Do you think that any of those considerations would go into effect when they, um, they determined uh, the amount of water you could use? Well, it, it not, when I left, which is uh, several years ago, about four years ago, they not only didn't care. Uh, I mean, some of, these, some of my students were paying $700 a month only just to water their lawn. Well, and they weren't they weren't over watering. I mean, you know, I had seventeen, eighteen pine trees, or seventeen, eighteen trees, and a bunch of pine trees, and stuff, and and bushes and flowers and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Big 
court and you you got watered or it all dies. What are you going to yeah. do with that property if it dies? Yeah. So yeah. Why we're we're trying to sell this uh, property, and uh, can you imagine trying to sell it and uh, and having everything so gone? Yeah, you can't do it. No. I mean, why do you ruin my property because you mismanaged because you, the water? Right. Exactly. I mean, it's That's... not our fault they mismanaged the water. No. So I in the middle of California, and you see this, all these farmers are uh, basically out of business because there's no water. And, you know, you, you'd say, oh, well, it was because we were the fourth year of the drought. Well, let's, um, start let's, let's, let's look at uh, Texas. Uh, Texas, yeah. I had a three-year drought. I remember flying over Texas and seeing docks that were uh, a quarter of a mile from the water's edge uh, th- uh, two years ago. Now, if you fly over Texas today... They're needing boats just to navigate down the streets because what was a drought now is a deluge. You know, in our, our, our farm in Virginia, we've had over seven feet of water over the past 12 months. Seven feet. We're, uh, we're going to uh, play grandma and grandpa in a uh, cute little house in, uh, in uh, uh, the Cincinnati area. Do you know that it rains in Cincinnati four days a week, sometimes five? Well, humidity, I guess, he just keeps coming up and dropping back down. So. Oh, my goodness. There's no shortage of water. It's simply a matter of distribution. We'll be back. This article uh, says that the higher prices for bigger water users are less uh, are no longer uh, effective with wealthy homeowners. It says, since their lawns are more often than not tended by gardeners, they have little idea as to how much water they use. I tell you what, I know exactly how much water my lawns use. I know how to minimize that amount of water. As a matter of fact, the lawns use far less water the way that we're managing them than do the shrubs and the trees. That's just the reality of it. And that if I were to allow the lawns that surround this property to go dry. Uh, Kirk, if I were to give you uh, a box of matches and I were to tell you, I want you to go and light a green lawn on fire. How much success are you going to have with a full box of matches? I'm not sure a lawn would do it. Yeah, it won't. It's impossible. And if I were to give you the box of matches and I were to tell you that uh, I want you to go to a lawn that is nothing but dry stubble, how much trouble are you going to have uh, igniting that lawn? Yeah, you have a grass bar. Yeah, you um, formerly lived on the hillsides. Oh, yeah. The, the um, wildfires ever a problem on those hillsides? Um, we had them come very, very close one time yeah. in the big fires. It's pretty scary yeah. when you look at yeah. the whole oh, the mountain is on fire. Yeah, I've had three that have come over the six years we've lived here. Three that have come very close here. And uh, and do you think that uh, if your lawn is uh, is nothing but dry stubble and you've allowed your trees to die, that you're going to be more or less susceptible, and your neighbor's home will be more or less susceptible to that wildfire? No, it's, no, it's absolutely you just don't, it's just don't burn up everything. Man. Yeah, but if you're, you're a wealthy person, you also just die in your home for all the damage you've done to the... Uh, Environment, right? Well, then the fact that I, you know, except, except all the, except the people that you employ and the people that <laughs> business. Oh, well, we'll forget about that. The yeah. Customer, uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. You know, they might, they may be a little mad about the whole situation, but, uh, yeah. Uh, I want to do the right thing, I guess. I yeah, so, from the mentality of the politically correct journalist here, wealthy people are stupid. Because it's only the liberals that are enlightened, and those wealthy people, they're, they're, they're just stupid. They just pay people to do stuff, and they, they've got, they're clueless. You know, who knows how they, uh, they earn their money, because it's for damn sure that they don't have two brain cells, as IQ would say of logic. Mm-hmm. Uh, here's the rub. Here's the person they quoted. Not a irrigation uh, specialist, no. The wealthy use more water. The wealthy use more electricity, and they use more natural gas than anyone else, said Stephanie Pinsel, the director of the California Center for Sustainable Communities at the University of California, Los Angeles. They have bigger properties, and they are less price sensitive. So if you can afford it, you just use it. So then this be, and listen to this. So then, so it then becomes a moral question. She said, 
but lots of wealthy people don't pay their own bills, so they don't know how much the water costs. How oh, you yeah, wealthy people, we don't pay our bills. Okay, I, Stephanie, we don't pay our bills. You know, you know it's, it's, it's a funny thing about uh, this society. If I don't pay my electric bill, guess what happens? I cut it off. What if I don't pay my water bill? I cut it off. Who do you think pays my bill? Stephanie? Uh, <laughs> Kirk? <laughs> Do you think we have this thing called a checkbook? Yeah. Do you think that once a month we get the bill, and who do they think pays the bill? Do you think that, are you so out of touch with reality that you think that somebody that uh, that lives uh, in, a, uh, in a house on a half acre or an acre has a, uh, a bill payer that comes in once a month, and, and that bill payer opens the envelopes, because oh, I want to tell you that the wealthy couldn't open their own. They probably wouldn't even know the way to the mailbox. If you have a mailbox picker-upper, and the mailbox picker-upper then hands the bill to the envelope opener-upper, and the envelope opener-upper then hands the bill to the, the contents discerner. And the contents discerner then determines whether that should go to the bill payer. And the bill payer is responsible for doing that. Is that what you think, Stephanie? Are you that out of touch with reality? Do any of these people have to footnote anything when they just make these comments? I mean, oh, do they have to say research shows that, uh, and based on this study, oh. and, I mean, or they just, you can just ramble on anything? Yeah, this is a moral issue as opposed to a distribution issue. <laughs> you know, there's a reason there's no hope for America. This is a, uh, a person who not only was educated at UCLA, they work for UCLA. They work at a university, and they are this ignorant, and they've established water as a moral issue, not a distribution issue. We're dumber than the Babylonians. <laughs>